Uh, welcome to the latest uh, webinar on behalf of the Royal College of Pathologists. Um, tonight's topic uh, will be one close to the heart of many of us um, who work in laboratories, and it's to do with safety in the laboratory during this uh, COVID pandemic. So without further ado, I'll pass over to Catherine Moore. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Catherine is a consultant clinical scientist based in Wales. Um, so over to you, Catherine, if you take over the screen uh, and you have your 15 to 20 minutes. So um, I've been given the um, an enviable task of talking about lab safety on a um, very blustery, um, we have a thunderstorm going on here, uh, Wednesday evening. So I'm really glad that people have uh, tuned into this. Um, so I'm going to start really by talking about what I'm not going to cover, um, but I'm happy to take questions on it. Um, and some of these things are because they come up quite a lot in conversations that we have um, when we talk about um, laboratory safety and in particular sampling. So the first one is, is sampling sites. Now that's whether or not you, you're sampling in a car park football stadium, uh, home testing, or whether you're taking from the site itself, so the anatomical um, sampling. So I'm not going to cover those at all. I'm not going to talk about packaging samples in any great detail either. So you know that, that, that we have category A packaging and category B packaging, um, but they sort of take up their own sort of time in themselves. Um, one of my specialist areas is, is swabbing and uh, types of swab, um, but I'm not going to cover those um, unless there are particular questions that people have about that. And I'm certainly not going to cover the different classes of microbiological safety cabinet, just to say that there are several types and uh, they're in different labs. And I'm definitely not going to discuss how to design a containment level three laboratory, um, which is something that I have been asked uh, during this pandemic. So um, laboratory safety is something which just, just seems to go on in the background. We all kind of know how to do it. We uh, know that there are problems with it. We know that when it's good, we know that we should be reporting accidents as they happen. The problem is that when it goes wrong, it makes a really good story for the press. And it also, when it goes right, it still makes a really good story for the press. So um, some of these are headlines which have uh, come about the last sort of few years since. So we've got the, the Russian lab um, explosion, which had a smallpox and Ebola in it, which obviously caused concern because there was um, some thought that the, this, these viruses might escape into the environment. There was obviously a few sort of lab slippages that happened both in the UK and in the CDC, which made headlines. But more importantly, when these um, issues happen, it causes a lot of um, uh, concern in the general public. So that when you actually do start working on things which perhaps are a little bit more dangerous, such as the, the research to look at H5N1 and the influenza virus to look at how it might evolve over time to become the next pandemic, research like that, which is actually quite fundamental to our understanding of virology, gets halted in its in its tracks. And that's that's something which which you know can can arise from from all of these safety breaches but right at the bottom is obviously something that's very pertinent to the current pandemic and it's whether or not coronavirus was an accidental release from a laboratory um, which was set up in Wuhan city and although the genetic data is absolutely saying this is not the case this rumor still goes on and that was actually um, from the beginning of this month so even people now still suspect that coronavirus was an accidental release and this is why when we talk about laboratory safety, um, you have to understand the big impact is not just for us when we're trying to manage when things go wrong, it's also the perception to the general public. Next slide. So I've looked at the wider implications of laboratory accidents. And the one thing I wanted to know, what I was hoping to show, was that actually the risk to the general public from release, accidental release from laboratories was getting less. And as you can see there, so I went to the Riddle site. Um, so that's the reporting of injuries, diseases and dangerous occurrences, which we have to do when a, a significant um, a escape or accident happens in the workplace. And you can see that actually the number of biological escapes seems to have gone up over the years since 2000. 2014. So in the last year, um, they counted 522 accidental releases. And in reality, that's because we're much better at reporting them. We're less, less scared to sort of come forward and say, yeah, we've had an accident. We need to resolve how we get over this accident. So it's actually a good thing that we're reporting more because we're not hiding it. 
However, when things like this happen, you get reduced public confidence. And we end up with greater scrutiny in terms of how we manage the laboratories, um, which, is, which is good. We need greater scrutiny, but we also need that scrutiny to be constructive. And sometimes we, we find ourselves in situations where we're not be having constructive, informed decisions made about how we manage things. We can then fall into, this, into the areas, particularly in a research laboratory where you may have had laboratory accidents, where you, your funding is reduced or you get particular areas um, where funding is reduced, such as coronavirus. Um, so the MERS, um, so if, if there was a release of MERS and SARS, you, you can see reduced funding there. And then, of course, if you don't get refunding, you don't get you, get, you don't get the recruitment, you don't get the brains coming in to really support some of this um, important research. And then the biggest risk, of course, is for us as laboratory uh, workers and people working in journals is laboratory acquired infections. And when those occur, whilst mostly they can be contained, there is risk then certainly with some of the viruses that you can transmit that into the wider community. Next slide. Thank you. So what I'm going to talk about is obviously the laboratory safety in the context of an emerging infection. Now, I do not have all the answers. I can give you some ideas on how you would actually assess the risk. But what I would need to do is di divide this into two areas. So we have the routine diagnostics. So this is the labs who do all of the testing. And this is a, a photograph taken from our lab in Cardiff um, with two of our lab workers there. And obviously the work that goes on in the research laboratories. Um, and I've particularly chosen this picture because it shows a lot of chemicals and uh, we've been working with research throughout this pandemic to support us in providing lots of chemicals to keep our um, assays working but obviously the two um, although they overlap so di routine diagnostics do, does do some research we're now seeing research labs coming in doing more routine diagnostics to support the NHS um, and you know having having that free flow is, is actually quite good in in the long term but obviously when you come to safety what goes on in a research lab tends to be more high level tends to be very virus focused and the risks tend to be slightly higher in a research lab than they are in the routine diagnostic lab next slide please so this is a very very big document um, so when you assess uh, risk there are plenty of policy and guidance that you should be using to follow and it is a bit of a tome and when you're working with emerging infections, you often find that when you're trying to read um, got policies and guidance, the policies and guidance changes so quickly that you, it's very difficult to keep up with it. But this is one of the documents, which is um, Health and Safety Executive um, uh, Management and Operation of Microbiological Containment Laboratories, which basically says that under the Health and, and Work Act in 1974, we have a requirement to protect the workers and those around us from deliberate and accidental um, release of biological agents. I should say that if you're working genetically modified um, uh, microorganisms, there's a whole new um, document that you need to refer to. So like I say, there are documents that read documents that read documents. So what I'm going to try and do is try and sort of cut through some of the jargon and just give you some ideas of, of how you might risk assess because I, I appreciate that there are labs um, in the UK now probably working with this virus who potentially haven't worked with viruses like this in the past and, and there will be some general concerns and I can absolutely reassure you that all of us are in the same boat even those of us who have worked with, with viruses like this the scale and extent of what's being asked of us is, is quite considerable. Next slide please. So the, you will hear a lot and you will read a lot when you're looking at assessments, when you're trying to set up your lab or work out whether your lab is, is safe enough to perform this work. Is, there's a term called perform a local risk assessment. And if you're not used to doing this or you're um, a fairly new person who's doing um, a health and safety or your, your health and safety lead perhaps is um, not on site with you, um, performing a risk assessment actually just involves three components. You can divide it up. So what's the agent that you're going to work with? What's the target um, host, so your workers, who are they? And the environment, what is your environment? And those all add up to give you a risk and then you can add up that risk. And then you can look at perhaps the worst case scenario from all of those things. If, you, if everything went wrong at the same time, how would you go about mitigating that risk, bringing that risk down so that it's safe for workers and it's safe for the general population and the environment that you're working with? So we know, for example, we're working with um, SARS-CoV-2. So what's the virology? What, what can the virus tell us about how, the, you know, 
what its risk is, it, how is it transmitted, how stable is it in the environment, should there be a spill, um, what's the infectious dose, that's very helpful to allow you to, so if you have a, um, a spill or a containment that you have to control, um, is there prophylaxis, is there treatment? When you took at your, your work, your work group, um, who are the staff groups, um, how many people are likely to be exposed at any one time, and are there people within your workforce who perhaps have risk factors for the disease that you need to take into account when they're working in a virus? So, for example, if you, if you work with CMV, for example, and you have a pregnant woman, you know, you need to take a risk assessment around, you know, whether or not she should be exposed to, to that, that particular virus. And then you've got the environment and the environment essentially is the workplace. So where, where is the work undertaken? Is your laboratory um, in, in an area on its own? Um, do you have, um, you know, class two facility, you know, category two facility? Do you have category three facilities? Um, is it in a hospital setting? Because the amount of work that you can do in a hospital setting, the release of a, of a biological agent in, in certain areas will give a greater risk. And what is the work being undertaken? Is it, is it fairly mundane work, fairly routine, or is it something more high level where you may need to take extra precautions? Next slide, please. So if we look at the agent, so um, here it is. This is a really lovely um, depiction of, of um, the SARS coronavirus. This is the CDC illustration. Um, it's in lovely 3D, which is showing you the, uh, the, the membrane and the outer proteins. Now, as we all know, it's a hazard group three pathogen. Um, and so that means that it's easily transmitted um, from person to person. Um, it can cause severe disease. And it, it says may or may not be any some prophylaxis or vaccine available for it. And we know at this current moment, there is neither. So there is no prophylaxis and there is no vaccine. It's an enveloped RNA virus. And actually the envelope actually gives it a, an Achilles heel. Envelope viruses tend to be less stable um, in the environment than, than non-envelope viruses. We know that it has an aerosol route of transmission and it's generally a large droplet. The infectious dose, interestingly, still hasn't been determined, but is it a respiratory virus? We would suspect that the dose is actually quite low, um, not norovirus level low, but you know, reasonably low. Um, the stability in the environment we know now is quite dependent on the matrix. So there's some really nice data coming out to show that if you just have the virus in some cell, in some virus transport media, it becomes inactivated a lot more quickly than if it was in a respiratory droplet. So mucus tends to protect it, which stands to reason because the virus in its natural um, environment wants to survive for longer periods of time. So when it is coughed out, it wants to be able to transmit to, to the next host. We know that the viral load is highest in early infections. So if you're taking samples from people with a, a acute infection, you know that the viral load is most likely to be um, um, higher at that point. But after the eight days post-infection, we now know that the virus becomes difficult to recover in cell cultures. So you know that the viability over time reduces. So these are all things, these are all facts you can take forward to, in terms of the agent to actually start mitigating the risk um, from, from exposure to this, this pathogen. Next slide, please. So if we look at the um, laboratory worker, well, actually, um, in a routine lab, we have all of the safety aspects already in place. I mean, we have um, staff who are trained and competent. Um, we generally take people who are uh, registered with HCPC, so biomedical scientists, and support workers are normally um, uh, offered supervision from people with that registration. We need to make sure that those staff, when you're, bringing, when you're looking at new emerging viruses in particular or pathogens, you need to make sure that they're fully informed about the nature of the agent and the environment that they're working with and the potential risks of, of exposure to that virus. We keep records of immunizations and there is a clear process in place for reporting accidents. Like I say, the riddle and the data that we all have integral to our laboratory plans that we sometimes forget we have them, but they've all been put into place to allow us to protect the laboratory worker. We also have an understanding of emergency procedures. So if you have a spillage of something which is a bit more of a high risk, you know how to manage that spill or you know to go and get somebody to manage that spill for you. And we also have um, more recently um, uh, local risk assessments now um, about individual risks associated particularly with disease from COVID-19. We know that um, people with certain underlying conditions are more likely to be um, infectious. There's no vaccine to protect those people. Um, and you, we know that um, the BAME communities in particular seem to be adversely affected. So, so all of these things can be done to help protect the laboratory worker. And I haven't come in, into um, PPE at the moment. Next, next slide. So 
this is the environment, the laboratory. And so you have um, a primary way of um, protecting yourself. So that is your, your personal protective equipment. And that depends on what you're actually working with. I have no idea what was drawn down the middle of that slide there. Um, so uh, interestingly, your containment level and your hazard group kind of go together. So um, things in hazard group two go into BSL two and three and four and so on. Um, and generally, uh, a good laboratory practice. So these are the things that we're trained to do from very junior um, scientists. We know how to, that we, we can't um, dr eat, drink in the lab. We know to wear um, a, a lab coat. We know to wash our hands when we leave. Um, we know to wear um, goggles should we need to um, if we're doing anything that involves splash. Um, and BSL2 is where most of the UK laboratories are, say, are set. So these are the basic di um, diagnostic labs. And so normally you have um, the same good laboratory practice plus enhanced per personal protective equipment. And you encourage people to wear it where appropriate. And in terms of safety equipment, you, you generally can work on an open bench. And there's normally um, a microbiological safety cabinet available for if you're doing a procedure which might cause aerosolization. So our hazard group three pathogen, however, should be worked at up in containment level three. And this is generally where enhanced diagnostic um, work is undertaken. So things like TB, um, where you're, you're processing sputum samples, where you've got a higher risk of being exposed to, to pathogens so that, that fill, fall into that category. And obviously a lot of research labs, um, specialist research, um, will actually go up to hazard three as well. And basically this is the same then as a, as a containment level two. You have some enhanced PPE, so you, you, you wear maybe a separate lab coat, you've got specialised equipment in there, but you have also controlled access. So people have to be trained to work at this level. So anybody who's just an experienced microbiologist can't just work in, in BSL-3. They need to be properly trained and that training needs to be documented and renewed on a, on a fairly regular basis and documented that it has been renewed. The, the lab is normally under negative pressure and most of the work is, is um, performed in, a, in a, um, a microbiological safety cabinet. And then obviously you've got the BSL-4, which most UK laboratories don't work at. Those are the dangerous pathogen units, um, and this pathogen hopefully won't ever get to that. Um, next slide, please. So the challenges of working at, at containment level three. So I can, I can talk about sort of experiences that we've had locally. Um, so the first thing you, you would notice, you have a reduced workforce for several reasons. The first thing, like I said, you have to be explicitly trained to work at this level. And so that's fewer staff capable of working at that level. And then most of these labs are actually fairly small in size. So if you were talking about social distancing and whether you have to wear face masks, you can't get as many people in the lab. And when we were talking about the numbers of samples that we're coming to, so in Cardiff at the moment, we're processing quite easily between two and a half and 3,000 samples a day. And trying to get those into your category three laboratory to process and number up and do all of the, the pre-analytical stuff is actually quite challenging. Um, and then obviously it produces a lot of waste um, and all of that waste has to be autoclaved and in specific bins. And so that turnaround causes problems. And then there's a de decontamination step. So every time you process at CL3, you need to decontaminate everything to take it back out once you've made it to a point where you can take it back to CL2. So this caused us a huge amount of, of problems um, locally. And I, and I think this is something which, which was fed around the networks of, of laboratories working with this virus um, early on in the, in the pandemic. Next slide, please. So what we've done is we've done some assessment of the risk of working with this, this virus in a diagnostic um, a laboratory, so a basic virology lab. And we're not the only lab to do this. I'm sure there's lots of labs around the UK that have done um, local risk assessments. So what we know is that, that for most diagnostic work um, involves molecular testing. And for molecular testing, you don't need a viable virus. Um, and so, you know, the virus can be inactivated to, to work at this level. Um, we know that upper respiratory tract samples are the most common type received um, and although in the primary phases you might get high viral loads in the sample, um, most, lo most of the lower respiratory tract samples come from the more severe cases and those generally end up in CL3 anyway because you're worried about other infections such as some of the fungal infections and, and TB. Most of those samples are received in virus transport media, so immediate, and, and virus transport media has one job, and that job is to maintain the viral, the viral viability to allow you to do cell culture. 
And so the greatest risk in terms of what you get in the lab is from leaking samples and spills. Um, samples arrive mostly double bagged. You have a sample um, tube inside a bag and inside a bag. And it's sometimes difficult to ascertain whether that sample integrity is safe. So the best way to do if you get samples in, that, that are leaking is to process them in an MSC in a category three lab where you can clean down. And so actually doing this risk assessment, I mean, if, if you put all of that into, into a risk assessment um, uh, algorithm, you would come out and say, well, no, I'm, I'm really uncomfortable with doing something which contains a viable virus uh, in, my, in my work group. So the likelihood is you would remain working at CL3. So next slide, please. So this is what we've done. Um, we, a long time ago, um, probably 15, 16 years ago, removed viral transport medium from our um, diagnostic pathways completely um, in virology. And this, this very busy slide here just kind of shows you um, uh, stepwise how we actually process samples. So we get dry respiratory samples into the lab. Um, they're generally um, wooden um, cotton tip swabs. Uh, we have um, lysis buffers aliquoted out and we take the swab in. We've got no virus transfer, meter. there's no spill associated with that. And we just break the swab into the lysis buffer. And I'll talk about lysis buffer in a moment to inactivate the virus. So all of this work, because we've taken out the fact that we, we've knocked down the viabil viability of the virus, that we're able to do this in an MSC in, in containment level two. And that's what we're now doing across Wales. And this allows us then to get that flow through. We still have access to CL3 for patients that we know are known COVID cases, for lower respiratory tract samples, and the occasional sample that does come as a liquid. So we do still get samples coming through the lab in virus transport medium, but we, we do tend to process those at, at CL3. Uh, next slide, please. Could, could you wrap up in a couple of minutes? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, so um, viral inactivation strategies. So the first one is um, addition of a, a swab to the lysis buffer, and a lysis buffer is, is essentially a chaotropic chemical. Um, it's often grenadinium-based. Um, you leave it to incubate before extraction and that kills off the virus. You do effectively get no loss in sensitivity as the RNA is protected. Um, you can't mix it with bleach um, and you need to make sure that your lysis buffers that you're using are compatible with the distance, different systems. So what I would suggest is if you're using an extraction platform is check the lysis buffer, which is done in the first step to see whether or not you can use that as an inactivator for, you, for your samples. Heat inactivation is becoming more and more positive, so we're using novel buffers which allow us to do that with less salts. Um, PBS is a classical one in TE, and heat is a very good way of actually um, deactivating the virus. And this can be extracted through our normal processes or added directly into PCR, and that's increasingly um, becoming um, more of a common step. It needs to ensure that it does fully inactivate the virus, which does require some assessment, and it might not work as well on sputum and lavage, so you may need to do some, some pre-testing on that. But like I say, heat inactivation does seem to be an alternative. Right, next slide, please. So cell culture is something which um, is mostly in research laboratories now. It's not done routinely across um, the UK. Um, cell culture naturally amplifies the, the virus. You're, you're purposefully um, amplifying the virus. You're purposely manipulating the virus. And so your risks increase significantly. And so mandatory CL3 working is for this. And then, of course, when I was talking about packaging, if you're moving cell culture around or material that contains uh, high levels of um, uh, this virus, you need to send it at category A, which is a specialist transport route. Next slide, please. So special consideration for post-mortem samples, and I know there's going to be some, some talks later on about it, and we often receive fresh tissue, and there is strict regulations about the retention of tissue, so ideally you want to have submitted the smallest amount of sample possible, so it can be fully destroyed in the process with no risk of um, samples being taken. And this is, um, if we go back, yeah, um, though back, it's gone mad, <laughs> and again, yeah. And so we want to um, consider targeted swabbing rather than collecting tissue. And so I'm just going to show you a slide now, next slide, um, of targeted swabbing um, during a post-mortem. And this is a measles case. 
and there's no tissue involved in this at all. We just swabbed different parts of um, this person who had died from measles to see whether or not we could detect virus and at what level. And you can see quite clearly there that the cellular controls, that the endogenous controls working really well, and you're getting good quantities of measles um, RNA detected in all sites. Measles is a systemic illness, just a good reminder there for your MMR. And this just shows that actually, you know, as you get into the lung, you're, you're still detecting high levels of virus at that but also it's in other, other areas as well. Next slide, please. So for other routine labs, um, viral RNA we know has been found in a range of clinical samples, um, feces, urine, blood, CSF, but not all of those have yielded, yielded viable virus. So whether or not it contains live viruses is, is, is yet to be fully determined. So therefore the risk is considered low unless the procedure generates aerosols. So that's like vigorous pipetting if you're vortexing. And when you're centrifuging uh, samples, you need to do that in a sealed bucket and uh, make sure the samples are, are put in an MSC um, beforehand and, and, and capped in them in case there's been breakages. Open bench work is generally discour discouraged, but they do give you lots of caveats um, and, and about, the, you know, that you could potentially use an MSC um, when you're using sus suspected cases. So, you, again, this local risk assessment thing comes in again. Standard cleaning for closed analyzers seems to be sufficient for in inactivating certainly the envelope viruses that we're dealing with here. And the amount of um, waste that's produced is generally quite small. So there's a high um, uh, uh, dilution factor so that it's not considered to be a significant waste. And obviously chemical fixing and staining is usually sufficient to inactivate most viruses. Although again, there are um, discussions about whether or not you should be doing that in an MSC. Next slide, please. So cleaning and waste, um, the likely uh, greatest risk is likely from the chemicals themselves and also from amplified products. You have to be aware that when you're discarding anything that's been through a molecular system, you don't want to contaminate your area with, um, with, with basically the, the, the amplicon itself, which cause more problems in your test. So like I say, guanidinium doesn't mix well with bleach, so you need to do a risk assessment in terms of what your waste is and you may need to get somebody in who to take away toxic waste. To careful cleaning and decontamination of areas using something with proven activity on enveloped RNA viruses and risk assessments then must include emergency procedures if you're working outside of CL3 for just in case a spill does happen and what's in that spill and how you manage that and generally most um, local um, labs and hospitals have their own policies in terms of waste disposal so refer to those. Next slide please. So in summary, uh, laboratories, the safety of the COVID-19 diagnostic response, you probably just haven't noticed it. And it's something that actually we battle with all the time about what's safe and what's not safe. Um, it's a hazard group food pathogen, um, but working with the sheer numbers of samples received at CL3 has been a particular challenge, certainly in the pre-analytical stage. And so careful risk assessment, taking into consideration the virus works force and viral, um, laboratory space may make performing many of those tasks at CL2 possible. And finally, my next slide, um, my deal to uh, Danny and Rihanna, who appeared in, the, um, in this, the picture of the lab. Michelle Peters, who's our health and safety lead and the audience for sticking with it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, and thank you for coping with the uh, technical difficulties at the start. Um, so I've had quite a few questions. Um, I'll start towards the end of the talk and walk, work backwards. Um, Particular, there's interest in particular sample types. Uh, so these are very specific questions. Uh, what are the precautions that someone doing amniotic fluid cytogenetics should take on a sample from a pregnant patient? I, I guess. I think I think the risk is, is more to do with the, the pregnant lady herself. I mean, is she, is she COVID positive? You know, I, I don't think there's any evidence of um, amniotic fluid um, being infected with with um, COVID or, or coronaviruses. Um, I think the risk assessment generally is around the patient themselves rather than, than you know, the material that you're taking. Okay, and a similar um, vitreous fluid. Do you have any uh, data on testing vitreous fluid and whether it's safe for ophthalmologists to operate? Again, um, you're, you're talking about the risks around the patient themselves. I mean, if they're infected with coronavirus, there should be some, some wearing of personal protective equipment uh, of, um, for the patient and yourself um, when you're taking that sample. And um, vitreous fluid is very small volume. I mean, we're not going to get gallons of that. So the, the risk is very small. And inoculum, um, I don't believe there's any, any recorded, you know, so if, you're, if you accidentally stab yourself, 
Um, I don't think there's been any recorded um, uh, infections associated with inoculum. It's okay. not aerosol virus. Okay, um, double bagging. Is yes. it necessary? It uses a lot of plastic. Uh, are there any more friendly ways of sending samples safely to a lab? Yeah, but you again, uh, you can risk assess it. I mean, dry swabs. I mean, I, I often wonder why we double bag a dry swab. I mean, there's no liquid in there to leak out. Um, it's it's basically because of the, the guidance around the category B. So we're kind of an, it, kind of in between A and B. So the double bagging is is kind of more policy rather than things. Maybe, maybe we could find some degradable, biodegradable plastic that we can use in the laboratory. Uh, and on the subject of samples. Um no viral transport medium. So it shows you how out of date I've become. Uh, <laughs> I still teach the students that you have to put swabs in viral transport medium before you send them to a lab. Um, that's very interesting. Uh, if um, somebody's asked, is it safe for someone with no prior experience to do rapid point of care PCR tests? No. <laughs> No, I, I see. I think um, actually, um, point of care testing. First of all, it's it's not recommended at the moment um, unless you're you're trained. Um, I mean, there's there's a there's a perception that point of care tests are really easy, um, and actually they do take some training, not only to perform them but also to interpret them. You know, they're not always as as cut and dry as you think. And usually, um, there's a POCT lead who will work with you and train you to read those results. So no, you you couldn't just do it I, I i would i would argue okay um uh do you have any data on whether there have been laboratory acquired infections from contact with pathology samples from covid patients I, i'm not aware of any um i know that there have been um uh, infections in laboratory workers but most of those i i would imagine have come from the community rather from than from the environment they're working in I mean, until um, we, we look at uh, perhaps genome data could tell us that, but I suspect most of the risk for laboratory work is generally from outside rather than the laboratory itself. Uh, and a related question is, uh, what is the data on viability of, of virus after death? Um, that's an interesting one. Um, I would imagine, uh, certainly um, in, inside the, the respiratory tract where you have the mucus, like I say, the virus seems to cope quite well in a mucus um, environment. But I, I mean, I suppose that once the, once the body starts degrading and it's releasing the enzymes that, that form part of that degradation, you might see the virus degrading. It is an envelope virus after all, you know, I, I wouldn't expect it to, to remain viable for that long once, once the body starts de decomposing. Um, I, I, I would have to defer to um, somebody who's done that work. Okay. Uh, is pipetting, which might be required if you are using viral transport medium in your old fashion, um, <laughs> is that an aerosol generating procedure and should that require the appropriate PPE? It can be, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're a bit vigorous, um, if you're very careful, you know, one of those really careful pipettas, um, most of us aren't though, are we? We, we tend to, you know, um, yeah, it can, it is, it is potentially an aerosol producing um, things. And yes, you should perhaps be doing it in a cabinet um, with all of the safety aspects around that. And to put you on the spot, um, what happens in your own lab in terms of PPE and mask wearing? Okay, so um, we, we don't wear masks um, in the lab at the moment. I mean, the, the policies are changing all the time. Uh, we're, we're not mandated to wear masks in Wales. You may know that, that we have slightly different um, rules and regulations. We're, we're essentially still in full lockdown um, compared to England. Um, so masks are optional. Um, and in terms of the laboratory, we've gone for more of the uh, making sure that um, our social distancing is in place. Um, and if in, we've given people the option that if they are working or training people and they want to wear masks, then, then that is an option. It's not mandated at the moment, but I suspect um, as, as things evolve that that may change. Okay, and uh, if you're in a lab, and for us it's happening in an immunology lab, uh, they're doing the antibody testing. So if you're handling blood samples, extra precautions. Um, 
blood samples, are, I think they found um, RNA in about 40% of, um, in one study, certainly in what 40%. So by the time you're doing an antibody test, um, you should be past the infection. Um, we've done a lot of work with PCR for the plasma studies locally, and we've tested hundreds of samples from patients who have recovered from COVID, and not one of them has been PCR positive. You know, so blood is a very low risk. Okay, and although nobody's asked the question, uh, I have been asked, um, what about uh, fecal samples? Because there is evidence of... There is, yeah. They, they, uh, I, I think the, the evidence is certainly mounting up that, that fecal samples may contain viable virus. Um, again, the proportion of the population that they think probably excretes um, is again about 40%, and it can be for a long period. I mean, what we're not clear about is, is um, how viable that virus is over a long period or whether, you know, what we're picking up is residual RNA. And again, it, it's, it's an interesting one because um, we're obviously looking at wastewater now as a, as a marker of, um, you know, whether or not there's, there's COVID in the population um, that we're not picking up. Uh, so, yeah, so, um, yeah, that, that's, that's an interesting one. I, and I suspect we're going to start seeing guidance changing um, associated with some of the new findings. Okay. In your risk assessments, if you have uh, members of staff who are BAME, do you take uh, special precautions for them because they're higher risk of serious infection? Yeah, um, we, we don't. Um, it, I mean, obviously, we're aware of them. And, and we. Um, so like I said, we've just started rolling out this um, risk assessment where, where that is being considered. And I, th and I think it's early days yet but we are very conscious of that group of people that they are particularly, they do particularly seem to be at higher risk. Um, and, and I think it's, it's a case of, um, you know, reassurance and, and making sure that, that they are, um, if they have concerns and they don't want to work in an environment that we support them. Right. You mentioned rid all right at the start. Um, yes. <laughs> It would be fascinating to know what those 522 accidental releases were. I know, I did, I did try and find out. Um, it, yeah, and, and I, was, I was quite surprised it was going up. But like I say, I, I like to think it's because we're more, being more open and transparent and sharing when we make mistakes. So somebody has commented that the situation regarding RIDOR reporting of coronavirus infections is very confused. Can you clarify? I know nothing about what the RIDOR regulations are. No, um, they, I, th I think a question was asked when I, when I had a look at the RIDOR page, whether or not um, uh, coronavirus should be designated on its own. And I can't see any data on the RIDOR site at all to suggest that, that there, it's being counted or exposures are being counted. I mean, it's a notifiable disease. Um, so, I, I mean, I don't know whether that's because, you know, that's the way it's getting around. I mean, I don't know how many accidents there have been associated with with coronavirus, or whether they're counting, you know, outbreaks in a in a in a work environment. Whether that would come under riddle, you know, I, I'm not clear myself. Okay, fair enough. Um, an old chestnut here: um, detection versus viability. So, um, what is the relationship? If you can detect it by PCR. Yeah, I mean. Uh, I mean, I, I think, I, I mean, I, I quite like the CT value 35 rule that when you get to CT 35 um, and you've taken a good quality swab, um, that after that point, particularly if you've only got upper respiratory tract symptoms or you've had upper respiratory tract symptoms and you're on the way to recovery, we're going to detect this virus for a long time in some people. Um, and that's RNA and it's not viable and those people are no longer infectious. I think what we're struggling with at the moment is um, interpreting those low level results because they appear as positive, particularly as they come out of um, the standard virology lab and where we're able to offer that interpretation and into the wider environment where people just get a text result. You don't get that feedback about, you know, whether or not that's a, a good level of virus or not. You know, yeah. so I think it's a challenge that we're going to be faced with. And I think hopefully more data will come out. And I think we'll hopefully I'm, I'm liking to think that we'll go back to time. You know, so after 14 days of onset that you are no longer infectious rather than relying on that negative PCR result. Yeah, I think we have to. I mean, we've seen PCR positives extend for weeks. in, in the Yeah, I, I mean, and it's, it's getting to the point now where we're not able to um, move people out of hospital because they're so waiting for that negative result. And it's in it's, it's a real, um, it's a real shame because people have recovered and they're ready to go home, but they're not able to. 
on the basis of a test result. Okay, I'm going to wrap up. I've got two more questions. Uh, one is a campaigning one. Uh, okay. should, should double bagging be subject to local risk assessment or should there be coordinated virology led guidance on this? I think coordinated virology led guidance. One of the things that uh, I struggle with working in Wales, and I'm sure anybody who works in one of the devolved, anytime you move away from something that PHE or one of the other things has slightly different, it causes us problems. Why aren't you doing the same as that? So if it was coordinated, that would be great. Okay. And a philosophical question to finish with, will COVID-19 change laboratory health and safety practices permanently in your opinion? No, I, I'd, like, I'd like to think that what it's done is challenged the laboratory safety practices, but it shouldn't change them because actually we're very good at managing these viruses normally. Um, this is just the numbers, it's a numbers thing. You know, and actually we've managed MERS, we've managed swine flu, we've managed SARS-1, you know, in, in perfectly rational ways. This is just a bit irrational. <laughs> right. OK, well, uh, I think I've covered pretty much all the questions sent to me. Thank you to everybody for typing in your questions. Thank you again to Catherine for giving us such a, a broad overview of laboratory safety. And uh, I've certainly learned one or two things this evening. Um, and uh, just to remind you, if you want to tune in next week, please re-register and the topic will be the neurology of COVID. Um, so with that, I will say good evening and I uh, hope to see many of you next week.